Welcome to the Neubauer Collegium for Culture and Society's Director's Lecture. This evening, a panel discussion, Embracing a Complicated Relationship, Indigenous Museum Practices. I am Jonathan Lear, the Roman Family Director, and I would like gratefully to acknowledge that all of us in the University of Chicago community are gathered on the traditional homelands of the Ho-Chunk, Missouri, Iowa, Ottawa, Miamia, Potawatomi, Inoka, Kitkapu, Menominee, Ojibwe, Masakwi, Sauk, and Odawa. This evening, it is my honor to welcome five distinguished Native American curators and scholars. They will introduce themselves. But let me say briefly that I owe special thanks to Nina Sanders, who is curator of the truly magnificent and historic exhibition of Salica Women and Warriors at the Field Museum and at the Neubauer Collegium. Nina Sanders is a visiting fellow at the Neubauer Collegium, and she is also now serving as consultant to the Chicago Blackhawks and works as curator and advisor on many projects. I'll also say she made this for me and it's a very beats wearing a tie and a real sign of our friendship. Now we have, all through uh, different degrees uh, had to endure the pains and sufferings and uncertainties of the pandemic. And it's a huge frustration to me not to be able to welcome you all into the physical space of the Neubauer Collegium Exhibition Gallery. But I can welcome you to a virtual tour of the exhibition at the Neubauer Collegium website. And you can also go to the Field Museum website to see a video of the exhibition there. And you can also visit the exhibition via this book of Salica Women and Warriors that will no doubt be talked about this evening, of which Nina Sanders is an editor and a contributor. And it is available at the Seminary Co-op Bookstore and on Amazon.com, and all the proceeds go to Little Bighorn College. I would also like to extend a heartfelt welcome to Heather Otto who is senior curator of First Americans Museum in Oklahoma City, and to Miranda Bellarde Lewis, who is a curator and assistant professor of North American Indigenous Knowledge at the University of Washington Information School, and to Elizabeth Hoover, who is associate professor of environmental science, policy, and management at the University of California, Berkeley. And finally, thank you to Teresa Montoya, Provost Postdoctoral Fellow and Assistant Professor of Anthropology at the University of Chicago, who has graciously agreed to serve as moderator this evening. Welcome to you all, and thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, and good evening. Thank you, Jonathan, for the wonderful introduction, and thank you as well to the Neubauer for hosting this virtual gathering. Given the topic of this occasion to reflect upon the necessity of Indigenous knowledge in research, curation, and pedagogy, I would like to take this moment to orient my relationship with you all today. I'll begin with my introduction in Dene Bazad. Yate, Shee, Tresamantoya, Yenishye, Tatnezani, Nishle, Belagane, Bashishchin. I am speaking to you today from Chicago, a city whose name is derived from the Algonquian name, which means river with shores lined by wild leaks. Owing to the multiple waterways that converge here, Chicago is home to many indigenous nations, including the Three Fires Confederacy, as Jonathan identified. Following the settler violence culminating in the Black Hawk War of 1832, and the 1833 Treaty of Chicago, many indigenous nations were forcibly removed from these territories or killed. Over a century later, under a different set of government policies called the Indian Relocation Act of 1956, many indigenous nations found themselves coerced to move once again, this time back to the urban centers where their ancestors were originally dispossessed. Today, Chicago has the third largest urban native population in the United States, with more than 65,000 Native Americans in the greater metropolitan area. The American Indian Center founded in 1953 
in the era of relocation, remains the oldest urban Indian center in the country. As this violent history illustrates, indigenous peoples and nations have always found ways to relate and indeed to survive. As a Diné woman living upon territories that are not my own, I strive to honor this indigenous place through my commitments as a researcher, teacher, and relative. I invite you all to re into relation with us today by reflecting on whose territories are you living? Whose histories do you acknowledge? Whose place names do you speak when you identify your street, a local park, or your current city? How then can we exist in better relation in these spaces we live, dwell, and work? Which as of late, I suppose might be the same location as I'm currently at home in my sweatpants. Nevertheless, the theme of relating central to many current discussions and native studies around sacred lands protection, environmental stewardship, assertions of indigenous sovereignty, and approaches to organizing and frontline struggles is also a critical framework for understanding the stakes of Indigenous museum practices today. In our panel this evening with four museum practitioners, we will discuss the nuanced complexities of working in and with museum institutions, of navigating differing ideologies of care and stewardship, and balancing relationships with colleagues and community, both living and ancestral. Each panelist will begin with a brief overview of their museum practice before we proceed with a group discussion. Lastly, we will segue to a question and answer session with the larger audience. Uh, I ask that audience members um, submit their questions via the Q&A tab located at the bottom of your screen. With that, I am honored to invite our first panelist, Nina Sanders, to introduce herself and share some of the amazing work she has been doing as a Neubauer Fellow. Hey, I'm Nina Dishoda. Um Biluga Bulashak Baleoshuk Biwulagosh Bagara. Um Biwulagosh. Uh that's just my introduction. My crow name is Brings the Water. I'm from the Whistling Water clan. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about Absalaga women and warriors primarily, but most importantly, I think to learn alongside everyone else as we are sitting in the presence of uh three incredibly, four incredibly um, important and um, thoughtful women who are changing things in museums. Um, and I was inspired to um, ask that these women could be part of this, uh, this panel because I believe that the things that we all have to learn from them are the, thing, the very things that are going to change institutions for the better um, in providing space for marginalized people, indigenous people, Native American people. Um, I'll go straight into the work that I was doing um, at the Field Museum. Um, what I come from, the museum work that I do come from, I was at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian, the Natural History Smithsonian, the School for Advanced Research. Uh, the co-foundation is where I actually started to curate. I'm thankful to Bruce Bernstein for that. Um, and in addition to that, I've done work with, uh, I'm actually on the herd committee, um, I've judged for them. I've done work for Swaya. So my life has been incredibly involved in art and with artists. Um, that's sort of at the center of everything that I do is continuously trying to bring the focus back to our native artists and the work that they create that essentially um, creates new foundations and provides new narratives for us as, as, as everybody here probably already knows. Uh, Native people have been denied uh, their own narratives in the histories that we've been taught in this country. Um, there's hardly anything about Native people in K through 12 history books um, up to this point, not up to this point, but until recently, most um, exhibitions have been, be have been curated by non-Native people. Um, and, and it goes on and on and on. So let me just go ahead and get into Uppsala Gawoon and Warriors. If you haven't already seen the exhibition, it's at the Field Museum. It will be open until between July 2021 and December 2021. As I'm being told, it will travel. So Uppsala Gawoon and Warriors, next slide. Uppsala Gawoon and Warriors um, was essentially a collaboration between the New Bauer uh, as part of the University of Chicago, the Field Museum, and the Crow Nation. Um, we had to get 
a lot of um, support from the Crow Nation. We had to get letters to be able to handle sacred objects as the Field Museum participates in protocols that essentially sort of guard sacred objects from anyone um, coming in contact with them, primarily researchers. People from our community obviously have a little bit more access. Um, and so to begin with, uh, this was part of the relationship building that I believe the Field Museum had already been doing as part of their Hall 8 project, which was an extension of open fields. Um, and that was between Jonathan Lear and Alec Hawali, two people. Alec Hawali is the anthropology curator at the Field Museum, Jonathan Lear, the director at the Neubauer, um, two people who had already been out to the Crow Reservation multiple times. Um, Jonathan actually lived out there for a couple of months when um, his son was very, very little. They lived in a cabin and both people built multiple relationships with artists, culture keepers, elders, um, you, you name it. And so in this, I think both of these people decided that, you know, this was a group or tribe that definitely could make some sort of a contribution to either the Hall 8 exhibition and as it became um, its, its own exhibition. So it's about 6,000 square feet. There were 20 contributors, over 20 contributors, scholars, culture keepers, artists, elders. Uh, and this exhibition essentially um, was built on relationship building. We began with the Field Museum and the Neubauer inviting about 20 people out, or I think it was about 15 people out to Chicago in April of 2019 where they were invited into collections. Um, we ate together. This was obviously before COVID. We all ate together multiple times. Um, we sat and we brainstormed and we talked about the different things that we would like to see happen in this exhibition. And then from that point, um, my family and a few of the other contributors invited people from the Field Museum and the University of Chicago to Crow Fair. We had almost 20 people that attended Crow Fair who camped with us, who stayed in our teepees, they stayed in our camp, they cooked with us, um, they fell off of horses, you name it, they did it. We had somebody who had some serious health issues and ended up in the hospital at um, Billings Hospital and she still believes that she would like to return because it's such a spectacular event. Um, and this was all part of the relationship building process so that we would actually do better work so that everyone would understand um, the ground that or sort of the footing that the other stands on. Um, in bringing Upsalaga people into collections, they started to understand the way things are organized, how things are cared for, conservation efforts, uh, the way things are displayed and so on. And so a huge part of the work that we did besides actually creating the art and writing the articles for the catalog was consulting with the Field Museum, talking to them about objects that were inappropriately displayed um, in Hall 8, which has been recently taken down, sacred objects that shouldn't be displayed, the way things should be stored, um, who should and shouldn't see them, and, and in, in many cases, what they actually were, what these objects are, and what they're used for in thinking about our descendants, and how some of that information should not be accessible to everyone. Um, and then I think, the last part of this event, because it's, a, it's an ongoing event, was the celebration that happened. Uh, it was like the third week of March when the exhibition opened. We had a parade. Um, everyone was invited. We had actually over 70 people that the Field Museum and the University of Chicago brought together collectively um, and funded all of the travel for all of these people, many of their families, elders, not all people who were associated with the contribution, but were Absalagap, are, are Absalagap people. Um, and they came in and did blessings, multiple blessings. Um, we borrowed horses from the South Side. I can't remember exactly what the name of that group is called, but the, the South Chicago Cowboys, they loaned us their horses. We went out and spent time there. We rode their horses. Many of Saligat people went out and met them and um, got to know their animals. And then the event itself um, essentially was four days of multiple celebrations, um, press and panels and eating and um, just coming together to celebrate something incredibly wonderful in consideration of um, the things that are going on in our community. It was, it was a ray of hope 
absolutely. Um, and I think next slide, and you can just go ahead and move to the slide. This, this is um, Adam Sings in the Timber. He was one of the people who was looking at the shields. These two particular shields are not on display yet. We have seven on display. Um, by the time the exhibition is done traveling, I believe we'll have about 20 that will be shown. 22, next slide. And these, those are, those are considered sacred objects. We have permission to show you photographs of those. Uh, and here are some of the Psaligya women who are contributors, advisors, artists, um, and this is us in the collections, uh, photo taken by Adam Sings in the Timber. Next slide. Um, and so in sort of tying up, I guess, what did we learn? Um, and I know we're gonna get a lot deeper into a lot of these issues as we move forward. Um, deconstructing the process was difficult. Many individuals were horrified at the idea of changing the systems that worked. And others like these women remained open and welcomed critical inquiry, dismantling of old modes and reimagining of new ways of making. Uh, so one of the things we dismantle is the idea of right to know. There are some things in our communities, in our collections, in our belief systems that not everyone should have access to, um, whether it's to see things or to understand why they exist or what they were used for. Um, so helping people understand what they don't have access to. Uh, escaping binaries, all Indians are the same, one answer applies to all. Um, and that is when, when the Psalagya came in, we had people who sort of would say, well, what do Native Americans think? Or what is it that you know your people want? Or how do you feel about these things in the collections? And I think it's become commonplace for many Native people to say, this is what Natives want, and this is what tribes think. And um, that is something that we are starting to move away from in allowing tribes and Native people to speak for themselves, um, to have designated people within each community to be able to speak on objects, art, culture, things of that nature, because we don't have one answer and we don't have just one person who can speak for everyone. Uh, collections, care and conservation, that was a struggle. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Accepting and integrating the various intentions and purposes behind making an exhibition like this. Uh, that's complicated. We'll get into that later as well. And of course, forgiveness and understanding. There just as Jonathan said earlier, you know, there was quite a bit of, it was, it was a difficult process. There was a struggle through all of it. Um, all of us had to be incredibly understanding, open-minded, and there was a lot of forgiving happening. Um, it, it, it's, you know, it's traumatic. It's, tra it's traumatic to be a native person in a museum and to try to rearrange some of the way that things people do things. And so it's incredibly helpful to have allies and people who have open minds. Next slide. And lastly, uh, just as a note, for decolonization to happen, there must be effective leaders willing to bring about change and the benefits of a dialogue between the colonizer and the colonized are insurmountable. And I think that kind of ties everything up. We'll go into detail about many of these different things as we move forward. Thank you. Okay, okay. thank you so much, Nina. Um, next, I'd like to invite Heather Autone to introduce herself and some of her work that she's doing at the First Americans Museum. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to join this conversation. Um, to my esteemed colleagues on this panel, I appreciate all of you being so kind and patient with me. Um, thank you to the Neubauer Collegium for Culture and Society at the University of Chicago uh, for hosting each of us from our virtual homelands this evening. Thank you to Dr. Lear and Jessica Musselwhite for the generous care you've taken to assemble us together. And most here, I want to thank Nina Sanders for curating this amazing exhibition and inspiring our, our conversation topic. Um, it's been a pleasure to cooperate with Teresa and the other panelists preparing for our conversation. And I also want to thank each of you. Um, this is probably the largest virtual panel I've participated on, and I've been watching that number go up, and it certainly is. Um, I'm trying not to be nervous. I can't see you, so that helps. But I appreciate each of you making time this evening to join us. Um, as I was introduced, my name is Heather Ottone. I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation and a descendant from a long line of beautiful Choctaw women. We've been living in Oklahoma since 1830 when the um, Choctaw were removed here on the Trail of Tears. 
My current work focuses on the preparation for the opening of First Americans Museum in Oklahoma City. Our institution will open to the public in September of 2021. As a non-tribal museum, we remain committed to serving the culturally and linguistically diverse tribes that are now located in Oklahoma. It is my honor to serve our Oklahoma community, but I want to share with you that as our team, which is largely all Native and amazing, every one of them, that as we are dedicated to serving the community, we carry with us the burden of speaking on behalf of our ancestors and building an institution for the unborn future of our Indigenous community. Next slide, please. We are working to build an institution shown here. This is a 173,000 square foot museum um, look, um, built up across three floors. The South Wing has been our focus since March of 2018 when I joined the leadership to begin moving the institution, which had been in varying states of progress and construction since 1994. The original facility that you see here was built in 2012, and then politics, Hurricane Katrina, three tornadoes and several governors later. With leadership from the tribal community, the institution began to move towards seeing the fruition of the prayers and hopes of generations of our state's community, many of whom have passed in the interim. Next slide. In the South Wing, there will be two inaugural exhibitions. On the mezzanine gallery will be Winnico, Life of an Object. It will feature some 140 objects from the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. Many of these objects will be brought home to be with their people for the first time in a century. There, that exhibition is just at about 8,000 square feet and it's located um, above um, on the mezzanine gallery overlooking the Tribal Nations Gallery. In the lower level will present Oklahoma presenting a comprehensive examination of the story of the United States told through the stories of our 39 tribes currently headquartered in Oklahoma. I'd like to observe many of those that were listed in the uh, land acknowledgement have been, were relocated into Oklahoma. Next slide. Both of these exhibitions have been built with tribal consultation with all 39 tribes, including reviewing the storytelling arc with rights of refusal for object selections, with participation in the preparation of the graphic selections and with a great amount of care given to upholding tribal equity within the galleries. We've worked with the methodology that I had been developing for my work as an independent curator FAM is the first institution where the methodology has been adopted as an institutional approach. And I'm really honored to lead our curatorial team with it. Our methodology is a team-based collaboration using the four R's of indigenous methodologies. Respect for people, knowledge, aesthetic systems, reciprocity as a practice at every level of our work, including one another. Relationships that in everything that we are doing, we are building concentricity with our community and objects, allowing our relationships to guide the choices that we make and actually embracing that the relationships are one of the most important things that we will produce out of these exhibitions. And finally, responsibility. Responsibility to the tribal knowledge, to the community members, and that includes our donors and supporters who are many of whom are not native. We are drawing inspiration and guidance from the wisdom of our ancestors to create exhibition concepts that celebrate our history and forge a path for our future through innovative and exploratory curatorial practices. Next slide. Ours is a work in progress and one that carries great challenges as we have moved from an open space to figuring out how to contain our stories, how to act responsibly with the stories for our projects, which we have been given care, and we have done so with very solemn hearts. The challenge of our project has been in the choices. Like all humans, I suppose, we've never been short of stories to tell, many of which could have been placed in the gallery and nobody would have wondered if they were the most important story. But it was in the selection of which story to edit out. Numerous, numerous stories that we had to make a selection that we could not bring it within this particular installation. Those stories would not have been present, would not be presented. And this is where we cried and had to hold ourselves in relationship to those around us, those that are not workers in our museum, those for whom our exhibitions will speak. Next slide. And as if we've made these choices, we've worked hard to show respect to the tribal aesthetics that code our indigenous knowledge. 
We've worked hard to celebrate the faces of our first American people, many of them placed in the gallery larger than life. Next slide. We've worked hard to prepare galleries wherein the faces and voices of our community members fill the air and space, hopefully acting as an institution for cultural change, addressing the invisibility and erasure so long affected by museums just like ours. Next slide. And as we've begun to see the walls erected and creating a structure to materialize our numerous stories, our 600 plus images, our 30 media projects, We've begun to feel the strength and power of carrying these stories to an opening day. Next slide. What we've learned is that working in the cultural sector as an Indigenous person is akin to being a warrior of sorts for our people. As we have needed to fight, sometimes with one another, to be confident in our choices, as we have wrestled with the burdens of carrying so many stories with us, many of which I've already started thinking what we will do in our next installation that as soon as we are able to get these stories open and carry them forward, we have worked with the confidence that as our grandparents have taught us, just do your best and it will be enough. Next slide. So I hope that if anything I've said or will say piques your interest, I hope you'll join us at the opening of First Americans Museum when we open September 18th, 2021. Thank you. Hey, 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 Heather. It's so beautiful. I'm really excited. I hope I can go see it in person. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, Miranda Ballard Lewis. Uh, I'd like to invite you to speak about some of your current work. Thank you so much. Um, look at our Suquamish Tapduamish on Ulak Nawe, Sisho Emaketsana. So I'm zooming in tonight from the Duwamish um, headwaters and I'm very thankful to all of the panelists for everyone uh, for the opportunity to speak to you about some of the work that I've been doing on the curatorial side of my work. Um, the other side of what I do is I'm an assistant professor of indigenous knowledge at the University of Washington and I've been able to so far um, bridge this, the work of din, I've done with indigenous curation methodologies and methods and with the academic work that I do. So I'm starting us off um, with a quote here from the first exhibition that I curated, and this was for the Fry Art Museum in Seattle. And this is poetry by Stormy Weber, who is Sugpiak and Black. And the words that I want to focus on was she says, witness not possess, nothing here is for sale. And so as we were going through this exhibition, uh, next slide. This are, these are some installation shots from um, Casino, a palimpsest. And so a palimpsest is um, paper when paper was extremely rare and they would erase it and the traces of what was there before were still present. And so you would get this layered piece of, this layered document that showed everything that was there before. And Stormy wanted to use this as um, a way of conveying the immense amount of knowledge that gets built up in indigenous communities over time. And through this exhibition, she was really exploring what happens when um, natives become displaced either by choice or by force, and how we can sift through archeological records, through art objects, through photographs, and to really start to see how all of our histories are layered up, even within our own family archives. Next slide. The second exhibition that I curated was Alison um, Bremner, One Gray Hair. And so um, at the time she was Allison Marks. And one of the ways that she wanted to explore indigenous experience, and I know that Nina already mentioned, uh, we can't say that there is a monolithic indigenous experience, but one of the ways that um, Allison wanted to uh, represent current contemporary experiences through social media. And so these form line wings, form line is uh, Clinket Northwest Coast aesthetic. And um, she created these wings. We had them printed in a um, 
holographic vinyl and she created a selfie moment. And the only tag that the only label that we had on here was hashtag form line, hashtag selfie, hashtag um, Allison Marks, Allison Bremner. And in this way, we were trying to communicate um, indigenous and specifically clinket aesthetics out into the world of social media. And we recognize right away that there was this generational difference in how different folks interacted with the form, how it interacted with this art piece and interacted with the hashtags. So if you follow any of those hashtags now, you can find evidence of Alison Bremner and her brilliance on all social media platforms. Next, next slide. One of the um, aspects of my work that I'm trying to bring in is native languages. And so with all of the different artists that I've worked with, we've found different ways to bring native languages into the galleries. And so on the left, you can see um, a story that I asked the Lashutsi woman to write. Her name is Noelle Purser. And um, she wrote about a um, two-spirit person who is from Mountain Salish who was um, a contemporary of Lewis and Clark. And she really started, um, she acknowledged the history of two-spirit um, genders in native communities, even in the earliest times. And so when um, this was, we had Noelle also record the, the story. And so you can see somebody standing there listening and for many folks here, even in the Seattle area, this was their first encounter with the Lashutsi language. And so bringing that into the art museum, into an art context is just another way that I like to challenge and that I'm able to challenge as an independent curator. The image on the right is Alison Bremner's piece where she was talking about the death of um, the Clinket language. And we're facing an extreme fear of, of um, the language dying out within the next 50 years. And so um, in this case, she was really making a point that it's up to us um, right now to take the steps that are needed to, to speak our languages and to do something about this language loss that we're all experiencing. And if not, then she just started naming these stars using a free star naming website thinking well they're out there in the world somewhere and are out there in the universe somewhere and so this is her comment on our need to take accountability and responsibility for perpetuating our own cultures next slide for both of these exhibitions uh, we brought in native programming that was for everyone but we were specifically focused on bringing um, Native people into the museum space. Um, as everyone has mentioned, there is trauma when it comes to Natives being in museums where either the objects of research or the objects ourselves. And so making us, um, making programming that was available and accessible and welcoming to Native peoples was an, of extreme importance to me and has continued um, through all of my exhibition work. Next slide. One of the ways that we do this is by um, acknowledging our own humor and placing our humor in proximity to very serious work. And so um, in this piece, Alison um, Bremner, she carved this, this face and the face is um, supposed to be stoic and manly, but it's in the middle of a sneeze. And so then she digitally layered that piece on top of um, von Max's um, palsy piece of this woman very demure lady and waiting for what I'm not sure probably waiting for the guy to <laughs> get done painting her but uh, we place this right next to um, the Fry gallery where there are these classic works very European and um, just left it there for people to make their own interpretations next slide in the, my most recent exhibition, uh, Preston Singletary, Raven in the Box of Daylight. This is an installation shot from the Museum of Glass in Tacoma. 
And um, in this piece, in this work, we were really bringing in ancient stories and a variety of ancient stories. There's not just one Raven in the Box of Daylight story. Sometimes it's called Raven Steals the Sun. Sometimes it's um, called Raven Steals the Light. But in all of them, we realized that it's not about Raven stealing. He was given this gift of light. And that was something that we wanted to communicate on a very broad level. Uh, next slide. And so in these pieces on the left, you can see that there's um, Preston's interpretations of the boxes of daylight, the sun, the moon, and the stars. And on the right is the final gallery room where you can see the, the world drenched in daylight. And um, we're bringing this to the National Museum of the American Indian where it will be installed in November of 2021, um, COVID through a wrench and everything. But uh, once it's there, you'll have a year to see it. We're really excited about that. And the ability to bring in ancient stories using new materials into these spaces that are doing um, more or less to bring in native peoples to make us feel comfortable, even when it's um, viewing our own artwork is something that is of great interest to me. And something that I've been always wondering is that, you know, as independent curators, as native scholars working with museums, we're able to bring in this vast set of resources of people to teach institutions about how to build up respectful relationships, how to practice reciprocity, and how to be um, have, have this responsibility to acknowledge this responsibility. But what happens when we leave? What happens when the project is done? And this is where the institutional accountability really comes in. And so um, I know that we're leaving space to talk about all of that later, but those are just some questions that I pose. Um, and thank you so much for listening. Hey, <laughs> Miranda. Yeah, I really like the points you're making about accountability and we'll definitely return to that. Um, so last but not least, um, I'm pleased to introduce Elizabeth Hoover, um, who can share with us some of her current work. Sango, everybody. It's really an honor to be here on this panel with everybody. Um, while it looks like I am in a field of Mohawk red bread corn, I'm actually zooming in today from Ohlone territory here in Berkeley, California. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the role of museums or potential role of museums um, in the seed rematriation movement. Um, I started out as somebody who um, was in the museum field. I got a master's in museum studies before kind of suddenly shifting my focus to work more in environmental anthropology and indigenous and environmental studies um, and then food sovereignty work because that felt like it was something more um, immediately necessary and urgent that I wanted to work on. But I still stayed interested in museums as places that held material culture that was related to food culture and could potentially contribute to this movement. Next slide, please. So people are probably familiar with the term repatriation, especially in the museum world. The Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act really brought this term to the fore. And repatriation is really the return home of things that have gotten to places where they didn't belong. So prisoners of war are repatriated to their home countries. Um, ancestral remains and sacred objects are repatriated, sent home to the tribal nations from which they were taken. So as part of the indigenous seed keeping movement, there's really been an effort toward um, reshaping some of this language and adopting the term of rematriation. So thinking about instead of this one-way process of sending things home that didn't belong there, thinking of it as reconnecting some of these heirloom seeds that have been taken out of communities back to the indigenous people um, and the indigenous communities from whence they came. And in the process of reconnecting people and seeds, also reconnecting people to land and reconnecting the seeds um, to the land from which they were taken. And this photo here is from Taos Pueblo when a squash um, came home that hadn't been grown there in 70 years and the Seed Savers Exchange, Rowan White, who's a, a well-known um, seed keeper 
who became the director of the board and made it an effort to find seeds in those collections um, and make sure that they were provided back to the communities they'd been collected from. Next slide. So I'm not gonna get into all these projects today. These are a series of other seed rematriation projects. Probably the most um, relevant is the Science Museum of Minnesota um, that ended up collaborating with the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network. But essentially in the Science Museum as in many other places, um, you had non-Native people that had gone out and collected all of these different seeds, either as curiosities or as ways of boosting seed production businesses um, and other farming projects. And in this case, um, in the 1930s, it was Wesley Hiller, who um, was an anthropologist slash dentist, because people had all the jobs in the 30s, who collected all these native seeds. They ended up in the museum in the 70s after his death. And it was in the early 2000s that an ethnobotany project started. They started trying to sprout some of these seeds. And it was really when um, Scott Shoemaker, who's a Miami curator, joined the staff in 2009, that they began working on not just growing out the seeds, but reconnecting them to local institutions, um, local tribal communities and different native food projects. So there's been a movement afoot of how do you get seeds back into communities that have, have kind of gone away and, and want to come home. Next slide. So I couldn't find the, the group picture of our whole advisory committee, um, but Nina mentioned briefly about how Hall 8 um, was really in need of a, a revamping. And I was invited in the spring of 2018, I believe it was, to join this committee of really amazing folks to think about how could this hall, how could these displays be rethought? Um, and the reason, and one of the reasons I was excited to join in this is because I knew that deep in the depths of the museum, there were seeds um, that had been sort of tucked away in there. And I was interested in, in getting access to those seeds and finding out what seeds were there um, and where did they come from and how could we maybe reconnect some of those communities to those seeds. Next slide. And so after um, you know, visiting with some of the, the curators in the, the anthropology collections and looking at some of the lists, um, it turns out that in the anthropology collections, there were a bunch of seeds from Tama, Iowa. Um, and I was like, oh, I know some people doing some really amazing work in Tama, Iowa, the Meskwaki Food Sovereignty Initiative. Um, so we dug into this a little bit and it turned out these seeds were collected by William Jones uh, in 1907. And he was the first native person to get a PhD in anthropology. He was from Oklahoma. Um, and he ended up doing a couple of different jobs for the Field Museum. He spent some time in Tama with the Meskwaki people and was sent there to collect all kinds of manurial culture. So this is the era of salvage ethnography where the notion is indigenous people are all just gonna die out. So hurry up and, and collect these things that represent indigenous life. So in addition to you know bowls and mats and clothing and, and weaving, um, he also collected seeds that wound up um, in these little bags and Ziploc containers and Tupperwares on the shelves there. And as you can see in Luke's hand here, he wrote on um, you know, old paper in pencil, the names of these seeds. Um, so, you know, I first paid a, a visit to these collections in the, the summer of 2018. And uh, the first reaction when I was like, oh, this is really interesting is people were like, lady, this is not a seed bank. Like, <laughs> this is not how museums work. You can't just come in and start pawing around among the seeds. Um, but it was like, no, but this is, has the potential to really um, reshape how we think about the relationship between indigenous people and museums and the function of museums um, as places that not just have this one way arrow of taking things in and hoarding them, but thinking about how do we also um, co-curate some of these um, relationships, these ideas of, of what the purpose of some of these objects are that are in this museum. And in this case, you know, many of the, the things that are in collections, there's a, a discrepancy between the notion of what's animate and inanimate. And in this case, um, these are things that were inarguably should have been thought about as animate. You know, these seeds are little living creatures. 
Um, so after a series of discussions, I went to Meskwaki and I visited with uh, Jonathan Buffalo here, who's the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, and said, hey, do you have any interest in reconnecting with these seeds before I kind of push this issue further, um, which they did. And so that spring afterwards in, um, in 20, early 2019, uh, some people from Meskwaki got the opportunity to come up and visit with these seeds and read these notes that nobody had, had spent time with in a hundred years. Um, and it was really a, a, a special moment to see people reconnecting with these seeds. Um, those 20% of each of the different kinds of seeds were then brought down to um, the, the tribal museum. And the reaction, this is uh, Jonathan Buffalo and Luke Capayo who have been working on this, was like, oh, field museum people are coming here to our museum, you know, instead of people from there heading up to Chicago to, to kind of knock on the door and ask for their things back. And so it was really the reshaping of this relationship. Next slide. And as part of that, um, you know, the effort was let's get these seeds back let's see if they'll sprout and you know these seeds are over 100 years old and they have not been kept in the most um, fantastic conditions for the purpose of revitalizing them but the the community was interested in at first in in not just we said okay there's labs at the field museum there's labs at um Northwestern University there where Eli Sazakovich, who's a, a research scientist for the museum, you know, he said we can work with them in either of these labs and the community said no we want to try first just soaking them and planting them the way that we would plant our seeds. Um, and so the, the museum staff said okay let's if that's how you want to do it that's how it should be done. Um, so the the seeds were, were brought down, the community had a, a feast, everybody had a good meal, and it was a good um, kind of bringing together of folks. We went back again um, and attended the powwow, and now all of a sudden instead of, you know, you know, we think of exhibits as sort of here's all these stuffy things on display, now there's some interaction with folks around the bean dance and bringing the bean dance and images and recordings of that into the display. Um, people got to visit with the garden, and the seeds didn't sprout the first year. And my, my thought was like, oh no, now what? Like nobody's gonna be interested in this exhibit anymore because part of how I sort of pitched this like, hey, let's get the seeds rematriated. And then if they sprout, what a cool exhibit that would make. And the museum was like, oh, okay, that sounds kind of cool. Um, and the seeds didn't sprout. But what has kind of sprouted, not to be have a cheesy metaphor here, is the relationship between the Meskwaki Food Sovereignty Initiative and um, some of the folks at the museum. So that now the exhibit uh, is centered not just on these seeds, but also ongoing food so sovereignty efforts um, in the Meskwaki community, the importance of feasting, um, the importance of reconnecting with some of the boons, spoons and bowls and other carved objects and bringing in contemporary pieces. And so there are biweekly calls now where we're working on um, what is going to be the text that goes into these, um, this part of the exhibit? How do people want the story told? Which objects do they want placed where? And so it's become a really interesting example of a, a collaborative piece that started focused on these seeds and has grown into a lot more. So there will be efforts this coming spring to try to sprout these seeds again. Um, you know, I've, I've been working with some folks at College of Nominee Nation and others and, and thinking about what our ways of sprouting old seeds, what is the range of possibilities and what would the community be comfortable with. Um, but if not, you know, the exhibit will still be beautiful. And I think this relationship that has developed between the museum and the community um, is something important that came out of this. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. I mean, this is amazing to see all of these projects together. Um, and actually, you know, leading up to this event, we had the opportunity to have several Zoom conversations to talk about the framing of what we wanted to talk about. And um, in several of these conversations, we had discussed the challenges of working in predominantly non-native institutions. And I will say not just museum institutions, but non-native um, public education institutions. Um, so from this, I'm wondering if each of you could elaborate on some examples of some of these challenges that you faced um, working in institution and perhaps the ways that museums have changed in response or maybe not changed enough in response to these challenges. I'll jump on that, that's okay. Yeah. So um, 
Oh my gosh, Liz, I got so excited watching your presentation and seeing all the connections um, between Oklahoma, our community here, and all the projects and just everybody. I mean, this is just such exciting work and it's a really exciting time for us as Native people to be gaining positions where we have some privilege and can really use our cultural capital to benefit our communities. And um, I think that's one of the things that I was thinking about when we had talked about like, what is it to be working in a native institution where I feel like I am right now versus a non-native institution. And, and I'm using as a comparison, my position as curator of Native American and non-Western art at the University of Oklahoma, um, which is as an extension of the university by its very nature, not a native institution yet one day, but not yet. Um, but thinking about like, you know, it's an interesting thing because one of the things that I was thinking about is um, how when I was working in a non-native institutions and there were moments of real conflict, um, I assumed that those conflicts came out of um, some of the sort of broader social norms that exist now, for instance, you know, racism, xenophobia, um, settler colonialism, right? That I was working within an institution wherein our native um, sort of philosophies were not the groundwork upon which I was trying to do something that would benefit my community, my tribal community um, broadly, but also, you know, also the rest of the community, because I think there's real genuine benefits of bringing indigenous philosophy into non-native environments. And the whole time I worked there, that was something that I really felt like, you know, it's okay, this is part of the this part of the sacrifices that have to be made. I saw those same sacrifices were made by the scholars and elders who helped bring me up through my doctoral program, right? I had seen native people who had made real sacrifices both in their personal life and professional life, um, trying to hold space for someone to follow um, in much the same way that I felt like I was taking a position to do the same, which was, you know, kind of following, um, uh, Linda to Huey Smith says that, you know, she opened the door and her whole goal was just to hold that door open, not to walk through it, but to hold it open so others could walk over, walk through that door. And I had seen people take that position and then, um, and then felt like it was my privilege to hold that space for a little while. Um, one of the things that I learned moving over to First Americans Museum was that not all that strife was just social norms of racism and xenophobia. Um, working with an all native curatorial staff, which every one of the members of our curatorial team, um, there have been nine of us working on this project. And, you know, as our work comes to completion for the installation, um, we are, um, the contracts are ending because the work is getting done and that's fantastic. But through that process, um, I learned that some of those conflicts are a matter of just genuinely different cultural worldviews, different philosophies, no matter whether they're racial divisions or not. Um, working with nine people who we all come from different tribal backgrounds, we also had worldview conflicts. Like we also struggled with the fact that some of my team come from matrilineal you know, tribes. And there, those members I saw responded to my leadership very quickly. Some come from patrilineal tribes. And there was a real struggle in, for me to assume a position of leadership um, and to start working towards the goals that we had, wanting us to work together in that way. Those are some of the things that I felt like I hadn't really understood. And maybe I was working in some kind of uh, false narrative that I had created, I'm sure in my head that all native was going to translate to some altruistic harmony for our, for us. Um, that was so false. But I can say on this side of that, those struggles and on this side of this, is that through the process of moving through those challenges, and with the great guidance, Henrietta Mann, Dr. Henrietta Mann has been um, an amazing mentor to me and just um, affirming to me that working from our tribal philosophies that I am much more powerful and I don't mean that like you know power but that I am stronger and a better leader when I'm working out of a sense of love and appreciation for each of my team members and not working out of frustration over they're not meeting their deadlines or they're not doing just what I've told them to do um, 
but loving them and working with them through that. And so in a way, bringing my, you know, sort of cultural philosophies to bear in an in a, um, applied manner, not just a conceptual manner has been a real challenge. And um, I don't know that the challenges I'm describing are even necessarily all the challenges that are out there, but they definitely are still there. And I think that's something that I think is just um, worth mentioning, I guess, is that working within an all native and a non native in environment, those conf there's going to be conflict either way. And so wherever you are trying to find some way that comes out of the truth of your own identity and philosophy that you can bring with you. I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> that. We don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a lot of what you were saying actually, I think, resonates probably with Nina's experience since um, you've also had um, experience working in many different institutional contexts, like when the National Museum of the American Indian, which is, you know, a federal museum, um, another tribal museum context, and currently a natural history museum context. So perhaps you could speak about some of the difference, differences and challenges that you've had in each of those sorts of contexts. I think those two questions, the first and the second, kind of blend together. Um, I can only speak for myself. I think my challenges in working in a non-native institution, um, there's there there were many, but just like Heather said, is you, you sort of start to realize that that's just part of being a human being, and there are differences between individuals that are obviously cultural, um, and and many other things, and so you know, without pointing fingers, I think that probably the most difficult thing that I experienced is that they don't, you know, they just don't do all the things I want them to do, obviously. <laughs> but besides that, um, I think um, having, having to reiterate some of the same things over and over and over, and then um, having to find new ways or re-articulate certain ideas or concepts or belief systems that um, we come from and why they're important. And even I think one of the things that I've had to really learn how to do to communicate with um, people in collections and conservation and maybe even in curation is um, take some of our cultural worldviews and then find ways to help them understand. Um, and so really just working hard to get people to relate to us, to open up a little bit. And, you know, I think that there's a lot of, um, people carry a lot of guilt. So there's always the apologizing, I'm sorry for what my people did. Um, I'm sorry what happened to your people. But then on the other hand is when you work in a non-native institution that has limited experience with native people um, and they've maybe got two or three people on staff is that there's this idea that um, there's one answer and um, you know they don't need to know everything. They like, just give me the information that I need to do my job. Let's keep this professional. And when non-natives in institutions like this, whether I think it's even in universities probably, but in museums, um, that's going to, the, the, the native community that comes in to collaborate is automatically gonna shut down. It's well, these people obviously don't really wanna work with us. It's extractive, um, they don't listen. Um, it's difficult to articulate to them or help them understand what it is that we would like or where we're coming from. Um, so there's sort of, sometimes there's a lack of um, open-mindedness in the way that these people on this side of the museum are thinking about this is a job, this is a career, this is what we do for a living. And then they take those binaries and then they apply them to the native communities that they're working with. So we're automatically expected to, you know, have an email address or you know, be able to have, have a Google calendar and why can't you Zoom and what it, all of these different things. I mean, just on a basic level, but then when you start thinking about cultural differences, like for instance, um, Obsaligat people, it's, we don't look people in the eye. 
Um, we kind of tend to look in the other direction. It's just sort of, it's respect, right? And I think if we don't have those conversations and build those relationships, it, which was something that we had to do at the front of this exhibition of Obsaliga Women and Warriors is we have to sit down and eat together. People need to build friendships and not everybody became friends. Um, obviously there was tension. There was a lot of tension between different groups, different departments, um, different individuals. And then trying to figure out how to be graceful within that without getting you know, irate or completely angry and taking things personally, which is really difficult to do for Native people who come into these spaces to do this work. Because I think nowadays Native people sort of assume, you know, while most of the world is woke, we're all exposed to different things through Google and the news and social media, and we should all just sort of know better. And, and museums are ahead of this, right? They, deal with people's cultures. But when you have people that are, um, who are supposed to be dealing with cultures, who are supposed to be understanding of people's worldviews and cultural ways of being, and they're not open to listening and learning about the actual living people that are in front of them, it can cause a lot of tension. It makes it difficult to work. And then, then you end up having a lot of conversations about why. Why are they doing this? Why are they this way? I don't understand. People get upset and then work doesn't get done. Um, so for me personally, I think that was kind of a lot of what was happening, um, having to constantly explain myself or reiterate things through the lens of science or anthropology or art history. Um, and I think when I'm thinking about decolonizing or indigenizing an institution, I would like for us to formulate some sort of a best practice in working with Native people. And I know a lot of that work is already being done with uh, people like Heather and Miranda. Um, but to have a best practice in really thinking about, okay, we have a new community coming in. What do we need to do? How do we lay groundwork to establish relationships and have a healthy working relationship with this group of people? And I think we have to let our walls down. We can't keep using like hegemonic structures to guide us in this idea of decolonizing museums. If you really want to decolonize, you have to open up your home. You have to open up your mind. Um, and one of the things we did with Upsalaga was, was the first initial meeting where we had the 20 people come and Jonathan invited us. He had Seder in his house and it was filled with Crow people. Um, and we sat and we prayed with him. And then when he came to Crow, you know, he does the same thing with us. He camps outside. Um, he eats with us, he prays with us, he listens, he tries to learn crow words, he tries to understand what it is we're doing, he asks questions, he's learned how to ask questions. Um, and the same thing with Alika Miranda Owens, who was the co-curator, she was absolutely instrumental in the entire process. Um, and so then, you know, even in that, there were additional relationships built. So even to this day, when I returned to Chicago, there are many people, many friends that I've made in this in this exhibition, in this event that I call family. And when they come to my home or they come to Crow Fair, they camp with us, they stay in our teepees, they cook with us. Um, and see, that's one of the points is they're not just there sitting at a table waiting to be fed. It's like you are part of our process. You're gonna watch our children while we're over here, you know, like flipping tortillas. These are the kinds of things that help people understand one another. Um, and I think one of the difficulties is that for the most part, when you enter into something as a career and then you're expected to work with communities and individuals and fully just integrate yourself into their culture or try to understand it, it's intimidating, it's frightening. Um, and so sometimes people just are not willing to do that work. Thank you. And I think what you're speaking to is so tribally specific as well. And I think that's another challenge in museums mm -hmm. is we have distinct languages and cultures. And yes, everybody knows this. Uh, it's a truism. But in practice, how do you actually implement, um, you know, these these practices of, of respect um, with, you know, particular as mean or um, as Heather was pointing out between um, you know patriarchal or matrilineal uh, backgrounds um, there's there's so many nuances and unique traits of different groups and even with 
within the Navajo Nation, for instance, you know, of my nation, um, communities are very different and you have different affiliations even based on states, you know, like I'm, I'm an Arizona Navajo, so we're a little bit different than Utah Navajos or New Mexico Navajos. And we have jokes about that, but there's a little bit of truth to that. Um, yeah, I actually wanted to follow up on this um, with Miranda because you have um, a lot of work working in art gallery spaces. And if you could speak more about navigating those sorts of relationships, because I think that's quite distinct from a natural history museum context. Um, and then what does it mean to be, um, you know, working in the Northwest Coast, which is a place that I think is very rich in Native culture and having, a, I think, a broader public presence about how, I mean, for instance, like land acknowledgements, other practices that maybe are taken for granted there that aren't practiced as much in other places. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, it has been a, a really big area of tension um, to try to figure out how to explain the jokes, like Nina was saying, the, having to explain why this piece by Alison Brumner is so multi-layered and multifaceted and is hilarious on 10 different levels and cutting right to the guts in 10 different ways without it being this gigantic didactic text because we're in an art museum. And so um, in those ways, um, in for both uh, Stormy and Allison's exhibitions at the Fry, we did decide, uh, we really challenged ourselves to have very minimal didactic text. Um, we negotiated back and forth with that the Fry's audience as um, progressive as they are, they still needed a lot of education about what, um, how, how different aspects of native cultures and specifically Sukpiak and Black and Seattle and Clinkit coming from Alaska, um, how those different native communities operated and how what we took for granted, like you said, um, was really not something that we could expect the audience to know. And so we went back and forth, back and forth about how much information to provide. And um, one of our compromises there was to have some, um, a lot more of the explanation in the opening panel in um, my statement as the guest curator. And so I was able to provide some explanation there and that way it would supplement um, the minimal text and for the art pieces. For Preston's exhibition, we, we took a totally different route and we just had the regular tombstone labels. So the title, uh, the title in Tlingit, in Clinket, in the Clinket language, and then um, the measurements and, you know, that it was by Preston because he created everything in that exhibition. And um, we really relied heavily on the catalog. And so the catalog is what um, where we had all the explanation. So when I mentioned that there was different stories that we drew on, um, we drew from five different uh, Raven in the Box of Daylight stories and then created our own version of it. Um, and that's what we used as the exhibition text that would lead the visitors through the art gallery. Um, at the Museum of Glass, you know, it was 11,000 square feet that we were working with. And so in that big giant space, we really wanted the story to lead um, visitors through this gallery, which was something that the Museum of Glass, I have to give them a lot of credit because they gave us, uh, they, they just said, okay, we're gonna trust you on this. And their, um, the survey work that they've done just showed that it was a completely different experience than folks were used to having at the Museum of Glass. And they really appreciated having that type of experience where they felt like they were inside of the story and were being able to experience Preston's artwork in a really different way. Um, your second question about how up here in the Northwest Coast, there's so many aspects of um, tribal and non-tribal relationships that I'm taking notes on for when I go back home to Zuni Pueblo, both in the ways that um, 
Native communities are run like in their leadership and their governance style and also in the ways that um, the arts are supported here in the Puget Sound area. And part of that is, you know, a very robust and collegial community where we, we know each other, we interact quite a bit. Um, we don't have to be friends, but everybody is friendly. And so um, there is just a really strong camaraderie amongst people in the arts and not just in native arts. And it's really beautiful to see. Um, on the flip side of that, Seattle, um, Portland, Vancouver, BC have all been places that have built their identity as um, a native space without really investing in native peoples. And so um, they could always be doing more. And so that's the, the challenge there of using native artwork to represent a city um, and to represent the identity of a city and a landscape. And so how do we push that beyond, hey, look at these awesome totem poles we have. Oh, and now we're getting more regional specific. So these are house posts, not totem poles. Let's honor the Coast Salish that are from here. But we don't have that many folks at the University of Washington. So how do we balance that out um, with the representation that is very visible through the arts, but also is backed up by our actions um, as we work with these institutions. Thank you. Um, I appreciate your, your perspective as someone who, as you say, is a, an independent or a guest curator in all of these different exhibitions, um, which leads me to my question for Liz. Um, so your role as a researcher and from like a faculty perspective, but also you done a lot of grassroots work and your garden work and food sovereignty. And I, I would just like to hear more about navigating these different sorts of roles that you have taken on um, and then how that relates to your relationships um, kind of mediating between museums and tribal communities. Yeah, I think um, in thinking about this question and you know, what are some of the main challenges, especially as somebody who spends a lot of time outside of the museum and then kind of pops in and I'm like, hi, I'm here, show me to your seeds. Um, is the, the siloing, and I mean, with any institution. So for example, at the Field Museum, you know, there are things in the anthropology collection, there's a whole economic botany section and these guys don't talk. So, you know, when Eli and I went creeping around up in the economic botany section, pulling open drawers and things, and we found some seeds that had been moved from some collections to the other collections and new names had put on them, but we knew that they were part of the um, Jones collection because of the little notes of paper attached and there were some things that you know have been separated from other things but they were sent you know because it's a natural history museum they were sent up to economic botany and there's been other stories of you know things have been separated and sent off to the departments that represent their um, components and so I think you know some of the challenges of any big institution you know I just went from a smaller private university to a huge um, public university is the siloing and the departments and you know dealing with all of the the personalities um, that head up those different departments and then just within an institution like a museum you know and museums were established as these like dragon layers of how do we gather up all of these things and you know these one way arrows of you gather these things and you hoard these things as representations of all the different spaces around the world that have been colonized in different ways and oh look now we have this collection that represents all of these vanished or vanishing people. Um, that now museums are dealing with the legacy of that original intention and those policies and thoughts um, and so thinking about. How do we reshape policies developed by well-intentioned dragons, right? And, and think about what should the function of a museum be? Um, what should the relationship be between the communities who are still here from which these things were gathered up, um, you know, when it comes to thinking about how these objects should be stored whether they should go home or stay you know the fear is like oh my goodness people will just come and just empty the whole place out like everything will be cleared out and the shelves will be bare um and in some ways it's like well no there are things that you know indigenous communities are glad to have access to in these museums and are glad that they were stewarded in this way and there's other things like 
let them go then and then just you know instead fill your museum with with things that people want to be there representing their communities um for future generations to come and visit so i think that's been some of the challenges is thinking about the different mentalities and again to get to what everybody's been saying it's not like there's one perspective on what should stay and what should go i mean even among seeds in collections there are some people that say those seeds are ancestors and they should all come home um, and they should get buried and if they sprout that's great and if they don't um, they should be buried like all of our ancestors are buried and other people say well no we're glad that those are here and we should keep a portion of those there so we can see you know what did the seeds look like that people were planting 100 years ago and how does that compare to what people are planting in the communities now and let's add to those so that 100 years from now people can look back and say okay here's um, how the, the the heirloom seeds that people are planting has changed over time. Um, so there's different perspectives, but I think it's important to keep those conversations open and um, make them participatory and, and have them be over meals. Like Nina said, that's an important part of it, I think, in, in developing relationships and not just having be a one-way arrow, top-down didactic kind of experience, but how do you make it a, a conversation? I think that answer is a perfect segue to some of our uh, questions that I've, I'm seeing pop up here. Um, so yeah, we'll leave the remaining time um, for this Q&A. Um, and I have a question here from Gretchen Stolt in Australia, who says, I was wondering if the panel could expand on what Miranda mentioned about long-term change in museums after the exhibition closed, the relationships uh, Elizabeth outlined came that came from her project is ideal. What kind of structures or things need to be in place for long-term change in museums? It's a very large, large question, but answer it in any way that you feel um, comfortable. Can we just say it depends and all of the above? <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things that I've heard about um, DEI and S, I've been adding the S, um, in response to um, a mandate by the tribal liaison at the University of Washington, the Saksacha um, to Ross Brain, who's also a delegate. And, um, you know, he has really been pushing everyone to include sovereignty when it comes to DEI efforts, because if you're not starting from a place of understanding the original um, agreements, government to government agreements on this, in this, what became the United States, then you are missing the entire point of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so to start with just training, to start with hiring Native people um, long-term basis, not just as guest curators, even though we bring a lot of pizzazz, a lot of ideas that are safe um, for us to, to express, whereas a lot of times it's not safe for staff members to express. Um, we can bring in very radical ideas um, about how artwork can be introduced in to different audiences. We can bring in a vast group of resources and networks, but you know we also um, can help bring in. We can help create a more equitable space that promotes diversity while supporting and acknowledging tribal sovereignty. And so I think having folks at the table who are willing to say these things, you know, is absolutely necessary, but making sure that they have institutional protection is a huge um, part of making sure that change gets implemented. Because if you don't have buy-in from the leadership and you ask somebody to come in as a, in a guest or a contract position, what incentive is there for the staff to really listen? Yes, I completely agree, Miranda. Um, Heather, do you have a comment? I wonder if I could follow up to that because I think the points that Miranda's making about, um, I worked for years as an independent curator and there is an incredible amount of flexibility and um, I loved your description, pizzazz, right? It's, it's you know, you, you're able to come into an institution and make, um, sometimes push the boundaries of what the institution might have been willing to allow its own curators to do because it's part of the relationship and i think that there's um 
a great deal to be gained from that by the institution. Um, and I think it's really important for those independent curators to have um, have the doors open for them to come in and push those boundaries. But it is so incredibly important for institutions to invest in bringing in Indigenous people into seated positions within those institutions and to make the commitment. And I don't mean that just in sort of a philosophical way, but really an economic way that the museums need to make an investment in their um, it within their um, staff and across that staff at all levels, right? So like I sit on um, some advisory board um, for different museums. And one of the things that, you know, I can see a push for coming from native and non-native members of the community is asking board of directors to make commitments for perhaps um, like as an example, that there could be a board position that is assigned and held for the local tribal leaders so that those local leaders can be a part of that conversation. And as a cultural institution would have an accountability at a much higher level than for instance, um, somebody who's working in the curatorial team or the education team or community engagement. While those are really important positions for native people to hold and they are and I don't mean it in any way to diminish them because they're often the ones who are able to engage in the conversation directly with the community at an institutional level having people seated in those you know upper from the very top down and making a commitment to having you know participation in all of those conversations so when there are tribal members and tribal communities coming that the directors see those for instance tribal leaders as leaders of nations, not just people who happen to be coming by to pay a visit, a collections visit, and recognizing the sovereignty of every one of our, um, you know, 560 plus tribal communities, recognizing the sovereignty of those nations and the related language and culture, and recognizing that those are things that the museums, while they might hold the stuff of those cultures, they do not hold the life or the capital, cultural capital of those cultures and finding a way to build relationships that will uh, and you know allow for an enunciation of the whole of that I, I think i would just draw us back to something that elizabeth was sharing in her presentation about you know i mentioned the four r's right so relationships reciprocity respect and responsibility um what benefited the museum that she was working with um that was, and I can't remember which institution, I'm sorry, was which institution was holding those Meskwaki um, seeds okay. was that the, the, the community by engaging with the seeds, which might have been in a particular biological collection, were then able to actually integrate relationships across collections in with the cultural and ethnological materials. And so understanding that those seeds and the relationships that came out of those seeds was not just the production of an actual um, plant, but it's the relationships of building those, you know, co connecting those co um, collections, connecting with the community and creating the potential for something that could not have happened a hundred years ago in these very same museums. And that's a very direct result of indigenous people being involved in this conversation. And I think part of what we're hoping is part of the advisory committee that's working on revamping the hall and um, seeing these relationships built and hoping that this will happen more often is making this part of the museum's culture. Because um, it can't just be some individuals developing some relationships and being like, wow, that went really well. Um, but thinking about how can all of the other exhibits go up, um, involve those communities similarly, and not just have it be when native people insist on it, but thinking about how can you develop those respectful relationships with um, people from all over the world whose objects and culture are on display there. <clears throat> um, so how do we improve these spaces? I guess, I mean, that Je Gretchen, hello Gretchen, it's good to have you here, but uh, there were a lot of questions in that, um, but kind of going off of what the ladies here are saying, 
and thinking about what needs to happen. Um, how do these places continue relationships, continue to build, uh, I just, I guess, make a commitment to communities, to native people. Um, well, you know, when I was at the Smithsonian, uh, I was an intern and we had this opportunity to sit with Kevin Gover. And he's the director of NMAI, right? And he's sitting at this huge table and there's like 30 of us and all these questions are coming out. And um, my question to him was, is how, how does the Smithsonian help native communities? Obviously we're thinking about the, the NMAI educates millions of people, but how does it actually assist native communities? What, what kind of work are they doing? And he said, um, he said, well, everything that I do in this space is to eventually push the education system to include our narratives in K through 12 textbooks, which essentially means that there is no true native history in, in the American education system. So let's just start there. If everyone coming out of the American education system who goes through college, who gets the training to become a conservator, who uh, trains to become a curator, um, whatever that work is, how do we expect them to even understand things like sovereignty, genocide, trauma, all of these different issues. So we essentially come in as individuals to educate large groups of people and that's if they even have an open mind for that. So my challenge to not just museums, but the University of Chicago is uh, you should be embarrassed if you don't have native representation. You should be embarrassed if you don't have a land acknowledgement. You should be embarrassed if you're walking around your campus and you don't see a single native American because there are millions of us, 578 nations. And in addition to that, you should have native people on the faculty, on the staff, on the administration, and then there should be programming. And most importantly, there should be native education integrated to almost every single program component. You should have native education in the sciences and anthropology, in the arts, there should be na native languages. Because if, the, if, if academia is producing the curators and the conservators and the collections people and the directors and the people who are essentially gonna run the show, and this is, this is all white supremacist culture, let's be honest, then how do we expect the people that we are anticipating working with or working with to have an open mind, to even understand the most rudimentary understanding of native people. There's 578 nations, there's over 150 languages. We don't all live in teepees, right? All of this basic stuff. We still say those things because there are millions of people who still think that everybody lives in a teepee. And that's embarrassing. We shouldn't have to say that anymore. Um, and so in that, I think that committing to training staff about native people like right now, because K through 12, we still don't have native led narratives, education, the true history of native people as we understand it. Um, universities should be holding themselves accountable to do that work because it hasn't been done yet. It's, un, it's unnavigated territory. Then that is a challenge. I'm challenging every single one of you as you know, students, as academics to do this work. We are sitting here trying to speak to people about what needs to be done, what's the things that we go through. I mean, it's called embracing a complicated relationship because that's all we do. It's complicated, every single part of it, it's painful. There's no way to separate the work that we do from who we are as indigenous people. And so if we have, I don't know how many Americans there are, if we have every single American who has a good understanding of what sovereignty is about genocide, about the contributions that native people have made to this society, and there are many of them, um, I think that that will absolutely shift the focus in the way that people deal with natives, the way they work with natives, collaborate with natives. We have so much to give. We have so much to offer. And here we are still fighting, still waiting, still talking about things like, well, you know, um, should we be, can we look each other in the eye? Like, you know, just really simplistic cultural things. There should be an incredibly complex, vast understanding of who the indigenous people of this continent are. I couldn't agree more, Nina. <laughs> Thank you so much for saying that. 
um, as someone who is an educator in um, and the only Native faculty um, at the University of Chicago, um, yeah, I, I do think that there's a long way to go in education because museums end up being the places where people go to learn about Native people and then they walk in not having a, a grounded knowledge and what that means. Um, or students who enter you know, my classroom who have never learned in their high school curriculum about Native history. They've taken US history, but there's no conception of what Native Americans are despite the fact US history is Native American history. Um, and we can go back and back and back. So I think, you know, I think it's really important to foreground that, that we're not just talking about museum institutions here, but we're also talking about museums of higher education as well. Um, and I think this kind of relates to a question here from uh, an anonymous person that said, much of what we see in museums relates to the past, to groups no longer alive. How must a museum understand the difference between a display such as one about ancient Rome and one about a Native American culture with people still currently living? And this will be our last question to close out. So if you wanna enclose any of your closing comments within this answer, um, feel free to do so. Well, the first thing that I would say to that question is that there's still Roman people alive. <laughs> And so um, we're not talking about a, a group of people that went extinct either. You know, we're talking about a way of life that is no longer practiced. Um, but I was just watching Gladiator the other night and, you know, I can imagine the savagery of that time frame. And when we're talking about that, I mean, that was one of the challenges that I have because I have worked exclusively with living artists. And that has been beautiful because their voices come through as they intended their voices to come through. It's also extremely challenging because they're artists <laughs> and they want what they want. And that's why they create the work that um, blesses our, our um, lives with. But uh, when it comes to this binary um, that Nina has mentioned about traditional and contemporary, you know, we look at it more as a continuum. I look at it more as a continuum. And so thinking about pieces that were made long ago and long, long ago versus pieces that are made today and what will be made tomorrow, um, it's all part of this continuum that acknowledges um, life cycle and acknowledges continuance and um, to turn to reference Visner um, survivance. And so this ways that people adapt to culture, um, you know, John Mohawk said that culture is the learned means of survival in any environment. And so now if we look at higher ed, if we look at academia, if we look at working with museums and not just being the subject of their gaze, um, we are adapting to being parts of these environments. And so I think that always goes um, when it challenges stereotypes about who is ex ex extinct, who is living and who has the right to speak about their own histories. Uh, it's gonna be something that the general public um, and museum staff have to adapt to and because you're just gonna see more and more of it. Do the other panels have anything to add? Can you Nina has something to say. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I said Nina has something to say. She's about I was to just like, I was like, wait, say the question again. We can repeat it. Um, just in sum, the fact that uh, museums usually present objects or cultures from the past. Um, they cited ancient Rome, um, but Miranda said, Romans are still alive, but I mean, we could think, I don't know, dinosaurs, for instance, you know, like there's, there's this obsession with, with the past, right? So um, how do you reconcile that um, with current living peoples and cultures um, because the museum is, is kind of seen to be um, associated with the past? 
Oh man, that's a heavy question. That's a lot. Um, well, Americans in general, I think in like the 1920s or 30s after World War I sort of became preoccupied with this idea of um, culminating like a European culture, class system, um, policy, politics, things like that. And so in that anthropology, and this is salvage collecting is going on around the same time, right? Um, and so they became preoccupied with the past and with, in particular with native people or indigenous people, um, for whatever reason, uh, collectors, anthropologists, just incredibly wealthy people became fascinated by sacred objects. And that's kind of where they started their collecting and then it grew from there. And so this idea that the past um, of it, of informs who we are today but putting native people in this like we're separated right like we don't know if they're dead or alive we don't know what they're doing we think they're completely assimilated maybe they still ride horses we we really just don't know right as americans and so i think that it's comfortable it's comfortable because what we've been exposed to are hollywood stereotypes sports mascots Ironically, I'm working for the Blackhawks, which um, Jonathan brought up, and I should probably address that just real quickly so that I can um, continue to do the work that I do, um, is finishing off that conversation, then I'll say something really quick about the Blackhawks, is that these logos, these stereotypes, they've replaced education. And so when you go into one of these spaces, if you don't see what you're already familiar with, it's going to make you in, uncomfortable. And in museums, they're always looking at like attendance, how many people are coming in, why are they coming in? And if you have, if you open an exhibition and it makes people uncomfortable because you've got contemporary art, you're talking about things in a different way, maybe you aren't encasing certain objects or it's historic, but it doesn't say that it's historic and it's articulated in a way that that indigenous person wants it to be seen without a date. Maybe those are some of the things that we do. Um, people don't know how to really take that in or understand that. Um, and I think, you know, we live in a society where we're constantly seeking out the things that we already know, the things that already make us comfortable. Um, nobody wants to be uncomfortable. So that's just sort of my idea on that. But if you go into a space and you see native objects, indigenous objects encased in, and they've got these long anthropological labels, that really sound like it came from um, an anthropologist and you really don't, you know, it's like, oh, okay, well, this is a nice little box. I think you should question that. You should write letters to the director. You should write letters to the curator. You should say, I don't understand why you're showing these, these, these things this way. Did a native person advise the work that you do? Um, and so think about who curated that exhibition. Because right now we as curators, I think it is in museums, we have this sort of formulaic hegemonic idea that a curator is one white man who basically educates thousands, if not millions of people on, on a culture. And as far as I'm concerned, it just doesn't seem healthy as a society for one individual to be educating millions of people about an entire culture. Curation should always be collaborative, particularly if you're working with living communities, source communities, if you're working out of a collection, those are things that are integral to the awakening of the American public. Um, oh, and try, I'll just talk about Blackhawks real quick. Um, my work with the Blackhawks, I'm actually working with the Sac and Fox tribe. Um, I think Joaquin Hamilton, who's one of their historians, is actually on this call. Um, and the Blackhawks have, haven't actually really had a relationship with the tribe. I mean, they have very lightly had a relationship with the tribe, but we're moving into a space where we're really asking them, how do you feel about this logo? What do you want to happen with it? How can the Blackhawks do better work and help you and reimagine the way that they present this war leader? And personally, um, and I don't, this isn't just personally, there are the people from Sac and Fox actually, um, you know, are the, that man fought for Chicago. He fought for his land in Illinois. He was part of many battles. He fought on the side of the French. He fought on the side of the British. He spent his entire life trying to remain in that area. 
So to remove his name is essentially like removing the Sac and Fox people from Illinois. So they have to have a say before anything happens with that logo. They have to decide how they want to be represented, how they want their leader to be represented. And then they need to be the people that decide how that narrative is delivered to the American public, whether or not they like it. Go ahead. Thank you, Nina. I actually think this is the perfect way to end uh, another complicated relationship <laughs> that you're currently navigating. Um, but I yeah, think had something to say real quick, though. Did she was like waving her hand? I was like, yes, because so much of all of the things that have just been said really can be tied together. And whether an institution has a native curator or not, the question is, how must a museum understand the difference between the display of these? And I think museums founded as a product of colonial expansion and imperialism and the museums came out of this practice of collecting the trophies of cultural, you know, imperialism. Museums need to be asking themselves what kind of museum do they want to be in the future. And that can be done in any museum and any size and whoever the staff is that question can be asked and the idea that the comparison between ancient Rome and a Native American culture. These are questions that if you even think about the fact that Rome and Native American cultures were both the subjects of imperialist and colonialist expansion and that Western philosophy sort of growing across and becoming, you know, fostering this sense of capitalism. Those kinds of things are all tied together and it's everything that everybody on this every face that you see on the screen right now. We are all working against that. And I think those are the things that I would encourage any museum staff or educator or literally any citizen of the world to be asking yourself is what is what is the role that that had in forming the way that you think about things. And it is our work to continue. It is my work. It is everybody who has a care about this. It is our work to try to replace that sort of imperialist expansion and philosophy and capitalist capitalism not to allow that to think that just because you have our stuff you own us or you own our culture or you own our people because that's where the falsehood and that's where that sort of underlying philosophical shift um, is founded so i would just challenge anybody to ask that question in the same way that so many other good things have been said i just wanted to throw that in there thank you thank you so much heather for sharing your words and kind of bringing us to um, i think a very powerful close um, this event. Um, so thank you all for, for listening and for tuning in this evening. Yeah, I want to add my deep thanks to all of you for such an informative and important and heartfelt and serious conversation. And I cannot speak for others, but I do believe that many of us have been listening carefully. And I hope that this conversation will spark other conversations throughout the University of Chicago community, throughout Chicago. And you know, we've had participants and listeners and watchers from around the world. And so I hope this conversation will spark conversations well beyond our local borders. Just wanna, you know, if I can put myself into words, I just wanna say thank you so much. And thank you all who have joined us tonight and good night to all. We'll continue this conversation. Oh, ladies, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good night.